This is a lecture for professional responsibility. We're going to be talking about ABA Model Rule 1.5. This is part two of um, our discussion of this uh, particular rule. You should probably, if you haven't watched the video for uh, Rule 1.5, um, part one that goes through the rule pr provisions themselves, you should watch that first. Here we're going to talk about some of the comments, the ABA's official comments um, to uh, Model Rule 1.5 and one of the ABA, um, the recent ABA ethics opinions. And we're talking about legal fees in, in these rules. 1.5 is our, our rule that's all about um, the ethics of attorney's fees. And just to recap really quickly, fees have to be reasonable. And we're, we have seven or eight factors that we're going to look at for reasonableness, like the time involved and um, <clears throat> the difficulty of the matter and the attorney's reputation and so forth. Um, uh, the second uh, uh, prong you may, or part B, was that we, uh, the fees have to be clearly communicated to the client, um, preferably in writing, including um, percentages and the um, uh, and what kind of costs and expenses the client uh, is going to be on the hook for, and also if there's a chance that the client could end up having to pay the other party's attorney's fees and so forth. Um, C and D of uh, Rule 1.5 are about contingent fees. C basically says you can um, charge contingent fees, but have to, have to, have to put them in writing at the beginning of the representation, and <clears throat> the um, and the uh, and the you have to disclose upfront, like not only what percentage uh, share you're charging, but whether we're going to you're going to deduct uh, fees and expenses from. Um, the amount or calculate that before you calculate percentages uh, for fees or after and so forth. And remember, you have to also give a written accounting at the end of the representation. D it says no contingent fees for criminal matters and um, or uh, divorce and alimony and child support, things like that. And um, rule 1.5E is about sharing lawyers from different firms working on the same case together and dividing fees. And basically the client has to consent <clears throat> and has to know how much each uh, lawyer is getting. And the lawyers have to, the share that you get has to be proportional to the amount of work you're doing or at least uh, the amount of responsibility and liability you've taken on. Now, uh, we're not going to do all the comments for 1.5 in this video. I suggest at some point you sit down with the comments and read through them once slowly. Some of them are a little repetitive of the, the verbiage and the rules or uh, kind of go on and on explaining the rather obvious policy concerns. So, um, but here's something that the rule doesn't spell out and that you need to be aware of for test questions and for your life as a lawyer. A lawyer may seek reimbursement for the cost of services performed in-house, such as copying or for other expenses incurred in-house, such as telephone charges, either by charging a reasonable amount to which the client has agreed in advance or by charging an amount that reasonably reflects the cost incurred by the lawyer. So let's pause for a second. What are we talking about? So let's say, giving a round number, um, uh, you charge, I, and uh, I'm going to pick uh, $200, $250 an hour for your legal services. That's your billing rate for your time. A lot of lawyers will also pass through other costs that they incur out of pocket to the client. And in, uh, one of the easiest ones for law students to, to pick up on is Westlaw and Lexis charges. And so if you are using Westlaw and Lexis as a student, it's free. When you're in practice, it's not, and it's actually very expensive. And you may um, have noticed that when you log into Westlaw or Lexis, there's a place to enter a client ID and things like that. When you're in practice, this is all going to be numbered and, and, and so forth. You're going to have a, a, a way of tracking clients so that uh, you get a bill from Westlaw that's subdivided um, uh, by how much time you spent per client. And, um, and then you're going to... Uh, just pass that cost directly through the client. The same if the client needs you to fly to Chicago and take a deposition or something like that, um, 
or, or do a real estate closing in, in Chicago for them, um, it, you can obviously uh, build a client for your travel expenses and, and so forth. So we have these pass-through um, uh, costs, but let's go back for just a moment. Um, that you, can, you can charge for some things, but you can't make a surcharge. So you either have to pass the cost directly through, i.e. like show, practically show the client your receipt and, and get reimbursed from the client on top of your legal fees, or if it's something that you don't really get a receipt for, you make a pretty good estimate or approximation of that. Um, in, in the old days, we would have had, uh, let's say international phone uh, charges. If you, um, in the old days, even calling out of your local area code was a toll charge um, and, and so forth. So uh, you can pass those costs through to the client. Now we have some ABA and ABA ethics opinion about this. It's from 1993, which is pretty old, um, uh, and you may not. Even, uh, some of you weren't even born then, I'll bet. Um, but the um, uh, but the remember that the the examiners for the MPRE treat the ethics opinions basically as the the correct interpretation of the rules and therefore part of the rule. Uh, uh, think of it as precedent. Um, so a lawyer may not charge a client for overhead expenses generally associated with properly maintaining staffing and equipping an office. So let's explain something. If you have a copy machine in your law office, um, modern copiers have a way to punch in a code, like based just like Westlaw, your client code, so that um, you get a digital information or your support staff that handles your copying. Um, can e easily keep track of exactly how many photocopies uh, to charge to each client and so forth. Um, now, what you can't do is like prorate your rent, like subdivide your rent, say, okay, I have 15 clients right now and um, I pay this amount of rent, so I'm gonna just uh, charge each client 1 15th of my monthly office space rent. That's your overhead costs as a lawyer. You don't get to pass your overhead expenses, your, your secretary's salary or receptionist's salary. Um, you don't get to pass that through, right? Your wardrobe costs, right? Um, uh, to, or your, tailor, your dry cleaning costs, you don't get to add it all up for the month and then subdivide it between the number of clients you have and so forth. That's your overhead costs and that is gonna come out of your income. And you cannot charge a client more than your disbursements for services provided by third parties, like court reporters, travel agents, expert witnesses, and so forth. So you don't get to charge a surcharge or premium. I have here in, in all caps and bold, bold and you got to remember this if you get a question. No surcharges. You are not the middleman. You don't get a middleman fee for arranging court reporters or investigators or um, hiring experts and stuff like that. You are going to pa pass those costs just straight through to your client. They're going to pay the bill instead of you in theory. And so please keep that in mind. You can recruit, you may recoup expenses reasonably occurred in connection with the client's matter for services performed in house, such as photocopying. And this restates what's in the comments. So I want you to notice that the ABA has e either incorporated the comments into this opinion or incorporated this opinion into um, the later version of the model rules and the official comments. Um, computer research like Wessel and Lexis, special deliveries, courier services. Um, uh, it, notice this, you can't pro, um, subdivide, it, like charge them for part of your uh, secretary's salary. But if you have a big case for a client that necessitates having your support staff come in on a weekend and then you have to pay them overtime. You have to pay them time and a half because it was urgent and trial is starting on Monday and so everybody's working around the clock. Um, those are costs that you would not normally incur and um, you're only incurring because of this client. So you can pass those through. So you can pass how much you had to pay your secretaries for the weekend to come into work um, uh, or, uh, or whatever the overtime charge was. Um, if, if they're hourly, but you can't um, uh, just charge every, um, every client like a secretary fee or something like that. Okay, back to the comments. I only mentioned that ABA ethics opinion because it fits with comment one. 
Um, it is desirable to furnish the client, this is comment two, with at least a simple memorandum or copy of the lawyer's customary fee arrangements that states the, in the general nature of the legal services to be provided, the basis rate and total amount of the fee, and whether and to what extent the client will be responsible for any costs, expenses, or disbursements in the course of the representation. Now, please note, this is saying it's desirable. So it's not, we only have a require um, writings, um, uh, written fee agreements for contingent fees, but, but um, we have a preference for it, which means it, we, we may hold it against you or give your client the benefit of the doubt when you have a dispute later on over fees when you didn't get it in writing. In other words, you are, um, you, you are falling below standard practices if you don't put fee arrangements and some of the details in some sort of written document that the client gets. You can't be disciplined for not doing that. Let's say if you're charging an hourly rate and you, you just make an oral agreement with the client. You can't be, you're not subject to discipline for, for that, but if there's a dispute about your fees um, later, uh, it's going to strike people as kind of um, poor on your part as a lawyer that you didn't bother putting it in writing. Okay. Um, this is important. This is, we're skipping comment three, going to comment four, because this gets tested um, regularly on the MPRE. Um, you can charge an upfront amount for a, uh, from a client. And this is very common. Um, I know lawyers who do family law. Uh, and uh, a few years ago, I had to, um, I, I referred a friend to a family <clears throat> uh, law practitioner um, in town, he, he needed one, and and it, the person charged fifty thousand. Said I need fifty thousand dollars up front, and what you do is they put that in an escrow account, um, a client trust account, and you draw a down on that as you work on the case. When you're done, when the case ends, if there's any remaining uh, money, you don't get to keep that. You have to give back whatever is remaining to the client, even if the client fires you, and even if they fire you and call you awful names and hurt your feelings, you have to give back the money you haven't actually earned. Um, and the, I, another person I referred to, a criminal defense lawyer, uh, same thing, um, $50,000 up front. What do they do? They don't go buy a new car with that. They put it in a client trust account. That entire $50,000 is de deposited intact in a client trust account. And then, I don't know, every week, every two weeks, every month, whenever they kind of tabulate how many hours they've worked on this case, they can, they can basically pay themselves. You're going to keep records, of course, out of that. When the representation ends, right, and um, like the char let's say the charges get dropped, you have to give back the remainder um, to the client. We see disciplinary actions uh, in, in my state every month. Uh, every, I don't think a month goes by that I don't see at least one lawyer getting disciplined because they're basically not returning the surplus fees, right? So you have a, a matter that resolves quickly. Um, they ask for money up front. Nothing wrong with asking for the money up front. Nothing wrong with that. Um, and estimating the total amount that the case will probably cost. And then if it's less than that, you have to give back the money. And a lot of lawyers um, try to hold on to it or don't want to return the funds maybe because they had a falling out with a client and you will be subject to discipline. And I see people every month get their license suspended over this. Um, okay, a lawyer may accept property in payment for services. We talked about this when we did rule 1.8a. You may wanna review that if you find this confusing. Such as an ownership interest in an enterprise, providing this does not involve acquisition of a proprietary interest in the cause of action or subject matter, of the litigation um, uh, contrary to rule 1.8i. And so we have a couple of uh, rules here. 1.8i doesn't allow you to buy into the case, right? Or to, to and what happens is the client doesn't, can't pay your fees. They're cash strapped right now. They're, they're, they don't have any funds available. So they offer to sign over to you an ownership share of their business or of their um, house or something like that. And that's okay as long as the representation isn't about that particular property or, and it could also be royalties and intellectual property. 
that, because that would sort of make you a party to the case along with your client. And you cannot do that under 1.8i. Under Remember, under 1.8a, if you are being paid in, in property um, in lieu of cash, not only do you have to comply with 1.5, but you have to um, co- fulfill the requirements, which is these three different um, sets of written disclosures um, um, and documents uh, uh, to the client um, in, in satisfa- when you're doing a business transaction with a client. In other words, you're doing a business transaction with a client as your fees, which means you now have, um, they come under uh, two rules, uh, 1.5 and 1.8a. Comment five to rule uh, 1.5. Um, uh, basically, I, I'm only including the example that it, it has a provision that says you can't have a fee agreement that allows you to just stop working once they reach um, a certain amount. So, so, so uh, let's say you have a client come in and they say, I only have $5,000. Will you do $5,000 worth of legal work um, for me? And there may be other professions where we let people do that, where we the person has a total amount they're willing to pay and you work until uh, you do that amount uh, worth. Um, you don't get to just abandon your client mid-representation um, because you've clocked a certain number of hours and that's how much they said they were willing to pay. It, you can withdraw if they're unwilling to pay your fees. That's different. You can't make an agreement up front um, that once you, you hit $10,000 worth of legal fees, you're out or something. Um, so for example, a lawyer should not enter into an agreement whereby services are to be provided only up to a stated amount when it is foreseeable that more extensive services probably will be required unless the situation is adequately explained to the client. So notice now we have two exceptions to what I just said. Um, first, if you if the amount that you agree to do uh, um, for the client is actually a realistic assessment of how much it usually costs you to do one of these c- cases. So let's say it's a routine matter like drafting a will um, uh, 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 for someone that's not a complicated estate at all or setting up an LLC for a new business, um, uh, somebody starting a a business or something like that, and you know how long it's going to take and you can accurately estimate that you can do it for $5,000 and so forth, that's okay. And if you run over a little bit, you're you're either um, going to be on the, like, like just not get paid for the little extra amount of time you spent on their case, or go back to the client and say, I know I said it was $5,000, but it's actually like 5,100 because it's something took me a little longer. Um, or if you have, you ex- fully explain to the client, look, I, I will do this and this and this, and they say, I'm sorry, I only have $10,000, then what you're going to do is say, okay, I can do, uh, probably will have completed this much by the time that your fees run out, your $10,000 runs out. And, and now what you're really doing is limiting the scope of your representation to that um, class of tasks. Okay, comment six. Um, this is a reminder that you're not allowed to charge contingent fees in domestic relations matters um, when the payment is contingent on the securing of a divorce or upon the amount of alimony or child support or, or property settlement to be obtained. Here's an important exception that's kind of a favorite. It's very tempting for people writing multiple choice questions because it's such a specific rule. This provision does not preclude a contract for a contingent fee for legal representation in connection with the recovery of post-judgment balances due under support, alimony, or other financial orders because such contracts do not implicate the same policy concerns. So if the divorce is all over and the person has... Uh, uh, the spouse has been ordered to pay a set amount every month in alimony or child support, and they are delinquent in those payments. And essentially, you're uh, bringing an action to col- like a collection action or to, inf- to, to compel them to pay the, the amount that they already were, uh, were ordered to pay. That's different. You're seeking post-judgment enforcement. Um, not uh, um, arguing about the amount. And so in that kind of case, you can charge a contingent fee. Okay, Um, this is not from an ethics, an ABA ethics opinion, but it's in ABA guidelines. They have a a separate manual that's kind of guidelines about fees and things like that. Um, Here's our bottom line, no flat fees in death penalty cases. 
Um, and so why? Because we don't want people saying, oh, um, this is really taking a long time. And I'm at this point, I'm working for free. And so you kind of give up. Um, you are going to charge what? An hourly rate. No contingent fees and also no flat fees. Now, if you want to charge a flat fee for DWI cases or um, disturbing the peace cases and minor in possession cases and things like that that are very routine, um, go right ahead, right? So if you say, I'll do your DWI for uh, $10,000 or $15,000 or whatever it is, and, and it's a flat fee, that's okay. If they're getting, if they're facing the death penalty, no flat fee. You are going to work as much as it takes to save your client. Okay, so here's a, the statement from um, one of the manuals. Uh, the ABA guidelines unequivocally disapprove of flat fees in death penalty cases precisely because such fee arrangements pit the client's interest against the lawyer's interest in doing no more than what is minimally necessary to qualify for the flat payment. Okay, here's a case that we get to talk about twice in our course um, about co uh, controversial fees. And this involves a tragedy that happened here in Texas in 1989. There was a Coca-Cola delivery truck um, down in Alton, Texas, which is deep South Texas, um, uh, uh, kind of clo closer to the Mexico border. And um, this truck was going over an overpass a high overpass over a ravine or a river and collided with a school bus full of kids and sent the school bus flying off of the overpass and into the ravine below and um, 21 kids on that bus um, died and the rest of them were seriously injured and were in the hospital, right? I mean, and so this made national news. It was this awful, sickening thing. We're going to talk about the lawyers in both sides of this case did ske something sketchy at, from an ethical standpoint. So we're going to get to talk about it twice in the course. Here we're talking about the plaintiff's lawyers. So I've explained the situation. The parents are shocked. You can only imagine. The, and and by the, these were kids. I think that I've read that they were high schoolers on a field trip. And so just imagine, uh, it's hard to imagine what, uh, what it's like to lose a child, right? Uh, and so they, um, they hired lawyers right away. The lawyers contacted the parents, offered to represent them. And the bottling company and the bus manufacturer um, immediately wanted to settle the victim's family's claims. And it, all told, this was the, the aggregate settlement to all the payout to all the victims was 122 million. That may sound like a lot, but remember, divide, we're dividing by 21 wrongful death actions and dozen more like injury, personal injury actions. Now, notwithstanding the early resolution of a case that was never really in doubt, the family's lawyers received at least, the lawyers received a third of the settlement in contingent fees. And so um, in 1994, a reporter for the New York Times went back and kind of did the math and figured out that... Um, Basically, because it, the the the, plaint, the defendants were in a hurry to settle the case because this was a public relations nightmare. It was a, on the national, uh, on the news all over the country. Can you believe? But this tragedy that happened—a whole school bus full of kids—and um, so those lawyers, just by happenstance, made about twenty-five thousand dollars an hour. Um, uh, for each lawyer involved in the case because they took the case on a contingent fee basis and it settled immediately um, in exchange to no, what amounted to nothing more than routine legal services, basically declaring that they were the attorney of record and, and maybe filing a complaint or sending a demand letter. Well, I got to tell you something. Um, it's not clear to me that that's a reasonable fee. And I, I think it's probably not. Now, remember, one of the factors for reasonableness is the result obtained. And so <clears throat> you could say, well, we got a result very quickly and it was very large. So I think that they were, they would be, um, the lawyers probably deserved, or there would have been no question that they should give, get a really unusually high amount, but $25,000 an hour is, um, I think, um, would be considered unreasonable. On the other hand, I've never heard that these lawyers were subject to discipline or that anybody complained or filed a grievance. So I'm not sure they actually faced discipline over this. 
But if you were in this situation and the bar, uh, state bar decided to bring a disciplinary action, I think that that would be considered an unreasonable fee. Later on, we're gonna talk about what the defense lawyers did. Okay, very quickly, just two slides about an ABA ethics opinion from 2016. Um, I think you should be watching for this on your MPRE because it's recent enough for them to be asking, to expect you to know it. And there's a couple of points that lend themselves to multiple choice questions. Um, 1.5E, this is about 1.5E and sharing um, fees and it's about referral fees specifically. A lawyer refers a, fa a case to somebody else and gets a referral fee. And I have to tell you something uh, for my students, I say this every year in class, the trend is away, is moving away from allowing referral fees. And so more states are either forbidding or restricting referral fees. They're very disfavored in Texas, right? And so in the old days, past generations, if you had somebody and you referred them, uh, a client uh, to another lawyer, because you didn't want to take the case or you didn't do that area of law, or you were a lawyer admitted in another state, or you're a law professor and you refer the... <clears throat> The person who takes the case would then give you a cut of whatever fees, especially if it's a contingent fee, um, uh, that they earned. The trend is away from that. And if you're going to try to do this, you better check the latest rules in your state. That being said, um, the ABA has taken the opinion, and this is what matters for the MPRE tests, is that if you are getting referral fees, you have um, technically undertaken representation of the client. And that has implications, therefore, for conflicts of interest under 1.7. Unless a client gives informed consent confirmed in writing, a lawyer may not accept a fee when the lawyer has a conflict of interest that prohibits the lawyer from either performing legal services in connection with or assuming joint responsibility for the matter. So a prospective client comes to you, um, they explain their problem, you realize you have a conflict of interest, so you refer them to a friend of yours in, in law, uh, in the, your legal community, and they take the case because you have a conflict. You don't get to get a referral fee unless you're going to um, get uh, c informed consent confirmed in writing from the client to the fact that you had a conflict of interest and they're still okay with you getting um, a fee. And so you could be subject to discipline. Watch out, this could be a gotcha question on the MPRE. That concludes our second lecture on rule um, 1.5.